Do you dream of adding your very own book to the collection of books that have already been written? Do you wonder where to start or how to finish? Does the idea of writing a book seem too overwhelming? Do you just want to polish up those writing skills or stay motivated? Do you wonder what to write about? Everything you need to help you write, stay motivated, and self-publish your own book is right here on one channel. And why? Well, because it's time to get over the writer's hump and just do it. You can write anything. Yep, you can write a book. Hello and welcome to a book. What a wonderful day we are having. I am thrilled to get to introduce to you today a wonderful author, a wonderful human being. His name is Adam G. Fleming. Perhaps you have heard of some of his books, I don't know. But today you are going to get to hear from him. He's going to talk to you about his book. Um, he's going to talk to you a little bit about the writing process, like we always do on this show. And we're just going to have fun. Adam, welcome to a book. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you, Laura. It's great to be here. Oh, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. You and I had an opportunity to get to know each other a few weeks ago, just uh, briefly. And I was so intrigued by some of the things that you have going on in your life. I mean, beyond just just the writing, you know, which is what we're here to talk yeah. about today. But you have some other things. You have ways that you actually help and encourage other people. And I, I hope you get to share that with the audience today as well. But tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from? When did you start writing? All the stuff we want to know. Okay, well, uh, where I'm from, I was born in central Illinois in a small town that was about a thousand people in 74. It's probably 800 people now. Um, I don't live there anymore. I'm one of the 200 that left. So I live in uh, northern Indiana in a city called Goshen, which is uh, a little bit bigger than my <laughs> than my hometown. Um, oh. It's about 35,000 people. So it feels like a big town to me. Um, what was the other part of that question? Uh, well, when did you start writing? When I start writing, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I used to tinker around with stone sculpture. I used to take my carvings to art fairs and things like that. And I had a back injury. Um, I had trouble with my back. Uh, I want to say back in 2008 or so. And so I started writing a play for the stage. And um, when I found a local theater that was willing to, to, to um, host it, a community theater here in, um, in the region, I decided to go ahead and expand that stage play into my first novel uh, and get it done in time for opening night. So that's how I got started my first novel, White Buffalo Gold, in 2012. Wow, how fun. Okay, so yeah. that was 2012. You've been writing for about 12 years then. Correct. Yep. Yeah. Well, it probably took me two years to write the first play. Oh, okay. a couple months to find a place to actually perform it. And then, yeah, so my I've been writing probably more like 16 years, I guess. And I what, didn't get my first thing published for four years, you know, it took some time. It yeah, took some time. Yeah, I think it does for a lot of people. I think it takes some time. So, OK, so the first thing you did was the play. Mm -hmm. And then what? What did you do after that? So then I did White Buffalo Gold, and then uh, I did uh, a nonfiction piece that was traditionally published by Entrust Source Publishers. Um, that is um, out of my expertise as a leadership and executive coach called The Art of Motivational Listening. So um, that was, I think, the second book that I put out in 2015. And then I got back on the, um, got back into fiction. So back into fiction yeah when did you get back into 2015 you said um I mean I was I was always working on fiction books as well so after I always encourage people like just write the first book and don't try to write two or three at a time until you've got one done <laughs> until you know and what after you're doing, that yeah. you, you end up having three or four projects in the pipeline at all times yes, so I, I know. always had yeah yeah so true so when you did that first play did you ever get that play published? You know, we never. I never published it. Uh, no, we ju I just oh. published the novel. Just um, the novel, okay. But we did the play at two community theaters and I got to direct it. So um, wow, and, how fun. And played a, for, I played a super small role and directed a cast of community theater uh, 
you know, geeks. And we oh had a great time. We had a lot of fun. That sounds like a blast. Sounds like a blast. Yeah. All right. So sounds like there's quite a bit in your repertoire. And I relate to that strongly because I, I know people who just stick with one genre. That's it. They're either fantasy fiction writers or they just write uh, crime novels, things like that. But they never really step out of their genre. And and I have I've written, you know, in a couple of different genres. It sounds like you have, too. Correct. Yeah. So we could talk a little bit about the Satchel Pong Chronicles, which is a steampunk series. And I can't show you all of them because I just ran out of copies of book one on Sunday. Hey, that, that's a good problem to have. It sure is. I yeah, have like third like order. <laughs> so, yeah. So book one's not here, uh, but I'll show you the covers for some of these. So book two, Satchel Pong and the Search for Evil. Nice. And I love the cool. cover. Love it. Yeah. This one is called Antoinette Joe and the Sky Dwellers. It's a beautiful book. I want to know what that's about. Tell us what that's about. Well, this is the third book in the series. Uh, this is where the Satchel Pong Chronicles, which is set in a steampunk world. So there's airships flying overhead, but Satchel Pong never interacts with them really in the first two books. So in the third book, you start seeing like, what what is life like for these, uh, like a tribe or group of people who live in the skies perpetually. So they're self-sustaining airships where they do their farming there and they, you know, they herd geese and ducks and things like that. And so you get to start seeing what's going on with the sky dwellers in book three there. Ooh, that sounds fun. Yeah. Fun. And then, uh, and then the fourth one is called Satan Kips to Fur and the Miraculous Yar Karma. So um, I love to invent weird religions <laughs> and uh, that's what I'm going to say about that. And then the fifth one is called mm. The Prophets of Doom and the Leaping Hedgehog. So and that's the Leaping the Hedgehog? <laughs> the Leaping Hedgehog. So that's the final <laughs> book. And that's the Satchel Pong Chronicles. Oh. So, yeah, steampunk, sci-fi, fantasy. It's kind of a conglomeration or mix of the three, uh, three genres. Okay, cool. I like that. I like that. Yeah. All right. But the your latest project, the one that we were going to talk about a lot today... Yeah. Is this is the what Stetson? The Stetson or, Jeff Adventures. So Stetson Jeff a, Adventures. If, if you like ebooks, it's a six book set. But in paperback, since they're sort of short books, they fit in a two book. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. Two, book, two volumes. So Stetson okay. Jeff one includes the first three Stetson Jeff, I would say novellas, you know, right? And then Stetson. Jeff Adventures Volume 2 yeah. finishes up the series. So now I have, so what is this? This is basically like a little bit of uh, like a Chuck Norris character mixed with Forrest Gump, mixed with Inspector Clouseau from the Pink Panther, mixed with Asterix and Oblix, the French comic character. If you're, if anybody's yes. familiar with Asterix, he's every, every Asterix book, he's in a different country. Uh, so he'll go to Egypt, he'll go to Germany, he'll go to Norway, whatever. Um, and so Stetson Jeff does the same thing in that sense where he's, um, you know, traveling each, each book is Stetson Jeff in a different country. So I, I know that when you and I first connected, those were the books that I looked at. I think at the time you had a Kickstarter going on and I looked at those and I, I laughed just at the description of the books. And I said, those are ones that I would enjoy reading because I like, I like things with a little bit of humor and it looks like there's a lot of humor added to that it just looks fun i love fun stuff and <laughs> it looked really really fun so I, yeah. I even sent the link to a couple friends of mine and said hey you, you know you got to check this out because it looks really good so yeah uh, yeah well thank yeah. you was uh, it fun to yeah. write it was fun to write so and just where did you, i know you told me but share with the audience where you came up with some of the ideas for this book tell us about so, that my co-author justin and i were both we were together at a conference in thailand and um, we just love to talk about writing together. So we got up early one morning. I want to say this was 2015 or 16. I don't remember. Um, I think it was 2015, maybe. We got up and there were a bunch of people at this conference in Thailand from Texas. And we started talking about how, what, you know, what's the culture shock like when you come from a place like Texas and you end up in Thailand? Thailand. You know? And and it's cuts such such different cultures, you know. And obviously, 
broader American culture is very different from Thailand as well. But we wanted to, you know, like, what are these Texans thinking as they come to Thailand for the very first time, you know? So we were just kind of riffing on that. And then we uh, were just riffing on this character. And when we were done with having coffee that morning, watching the sunrise and, you know, fighting jet lag and all that, <laughs> we were just like, we have to write this. So the first <laughs> book is, uh, the first book's called Beat Down in Bangkok. And Stetson Jeff is an heir to the hat company, the Stetson Hats. And uh, he's, his, his daddy says, hey, we're going to make our jeans in Thailand because it'll be cheaper. And Stetson oh. decides to go check out the operations of the, the factory in Thailand uh, to make sure everything's on the up and up, which, of course, you know, it isn't. And then he gets, you know, kicked in the head and, and things go on from there. Because, you know, when you're a kickboxer, you always get kicked in the head first. Oh, and, wow. Of yeah. course. <laughs> yeah. You can't you can't just be the hero the whole time. You've got to oh, be knocked man. down a few times. So, oh. yeah. Really fun. The, the whole thing just sounds absolutely hysterical. And I, I want to read it. I, I know. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people want to read it. That's that's going to be a fun one to get through. Uh, it's it's um, really, I, I would call it in the genre of action adventure comedy. So I want to, I want to talk to you for just a minute about two things. First off, you, you actually, you talked about that cultural shock, you know, Texans going mm-hmm. to Bangkok and, and having a little bit of culture shock, but you actually coach people on cultural differences is that right or cultural uh, what do you do exactly yeah I do I have uh, well I'm a leadership executive coach and I'm currently you know working at more in the world of like corporate America but it's it's interesting because in the 2010s most of my coaching with people was with people who were living and working cross-culturally um, either you know having gone from you know, say the UK to live in Bolivia or the US to live in um, wherever, right? Um, And so that was a lot of my coaching experience was working with people who were grappling through those culture shock issues of living and working cross-culturally. So um, that's a big passion of mine. And it's been interesting now to work less with people who are in NGOs and more with people who are in corporate America. But, you know, Currently, I have a client who is from uh, a Central African nation and only came to Canada a year ago. Wow. So he's, living, you know, so so it's like, wow, I'm really well prepared for this, you know, yeah. um, corporate work because there are lots of people working in corporations all over the U.S. and Canada who have come from other countries. Other, and are dealing, other places. Yeah. Yeah. They're dealing with. I've had people in corporate America who grew up in Poland and Argentina. So it's really interesting. And sometimes they find me, they don't even realize that I have that cross-cultural uh, awareness cool. or experience, but. It, and, know, then, and then you brought some of that into your writings, you know, that. Oh yeah. That's yeah. what to me is just wonderful. I love that. When you take your real life experiences and can put a twist on it. Well, even in the steampunk stuff where I'm making up weird religions and then I'm having people go from one nation to another in my fantasy world or whatever, that's a, you know, that deep experience of having dealt with and lived through culture shock and, and then just go like, what is going on here? You know, um, I, I bring that with me into my storytelling, no matter what the genre is, even if it's just kind of realistic fiction. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Well, if you're working doing that, I mean, you're coaching people full time. You have a lot of irons in the fire. I know that. How do you find time to write? And what is your writing process like? So I block time to write. So my clients can't can't take time between eight and nine in the morning. OK. Um, so, you know, I have a Calendly. I, I have 15, 20 clients at any given time. They can pop in and you know, grab, grab a, a slot for an hour or 45 minutes on my calendar. But I just have like a certain section of my daily calendar blocked off. That's my writing time. Nobody's touching that. I don't care how important they are. <laughs> and about how much do you oh, get done each day? Game, you know? What's that? <laughs> about how much writing do you get done each day in between that eight and nine o'clock block? Oh, in an hour, in an hour, I can usually write a thousand to 1500 words, sometimes only 700, depending on if I'm doing a little bit of research along the side of it, you know, Googling something and then 
sure. going down a rabbit hole and then going back to writing. But um, yeah, just, it's pretty productive. So that's your process. Do you write an outline first or are you one of these people who you just write and then you go back and clean it up? Uh, I, for fiction, I go back and clean it up. Yeah, I just go. You're not an outline it. kind of person. No, but when I'm doing like I'm I'm working on sort of a ghostwriting uh, co-writing project right now on a nonfiction book called The Legacy Way, and which will be out by the end of March this year. Fun. And um, yeah, I'm on a tight deadline, so I'm doing more than an hour a day on that and actually kind of um, it's such a tight deadline. I'm not working on fiction this month, but that's OK. I'll be back to it. And uh, what was the question? <laughs> Well, I'm I'm just curious about oh, your writing an process. Out, like how an much... outline. Yeah, yeah. So so you need an outline for that, right? Yeah. Okay. Of and then you get through it, you're done. About how many chapters will this next book be that you're working on right now? Uh the legacy way is probably going to be five chapters. There I'm doing some interviews very much like what we're doing now and just taking the oh, transcript fun. and cleaning that up. So there's oh, okay. not all of the book, but like the fifth chapter is going to be five or six interviews with people who are interested in legacy and, and are also doing like um, difficult things like mountain climbing or ultra marathoning in the Sahara desert or whatever. So oh it's kind of a combination of like difficult physical adventure along with what thinking about what it means to leave a legacy. So um oh. yeah that one's a rush job so that's getting a lot of my time every day right now yeah that's really neat and will that go to an editor when you're done or do you edit your own books how how is oh. your editing process oh yeah it's uh well fortunately for me I have a built-in editor in my house my wife is amazing and uh she um has it on her schedule because this one's a rush job you know she's expecting to start on it in about a week so nice Nice. Yeah, my wife. I I would never recommend that anybody put a book out with having at least without having at least one person put some eyeballs on it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. The last couple of authors I talked to, that's kind of been the the hot topic that we've discussed. Is you have to have that second set of eyes looking on it. My last book that I did, I actually gave out to three different people. My best friend is also an author and an editor. And she's amazing. So she edits for me and I'm fortunate because we're friends, so I don't have to pay her, <laughs> but, yeah. um, so I'm real, right. real fortunate there. And then I, my neighbor is an English professor. So I had him look it over and give me some really good tips. He actually used to be, uh, work for a publishing company. So I get some really good tips from him. And then uh, just somebody else that I wanted to have them read to see if they like the story more for content rather than to clean it up or anything like that. Sure. So it's important and it can be scary. You know, it can be really scary for people when they're first writing, when they're first learning to write, to share that work with somebody else. Because I think as human beings, we have this fear of rejection, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. so that can be really scary for some people. And, but I always encourage people do it. Let somebody else look at it. And you know that that fear can sometimes paralyze people and stop them from writing when they could otherwise have accomplished that, you know, write it, get it published and move on to another project. But they're so afraid that, oh, what if somebody doesn't like it? Or what if it's not good enough? What if I have too many mistakes? All of that. Well, let, me, let me respond to that as a coach too, or as a, yes. uh, maybe a, more as a motivational speaker, but instead of the fear of it not being good enough or the fear of people not liking it, reframe that as the certainty of it not being good enough when you're done with a draft. You need an editor, the editor will help it be better. 100%. So just, be certain, just be certain that it won't be good. And then you can also recognize the fact that there are 7 billion people in this planet and a large percentage of them will never hear about your book and a percentage of the people who do won't read it. And a percentage of the people who do read it won't like it. That's, that's just the way it works. So be certain that someone won't like it. It's not for everyone. It shouldn't be for everyone. Right. So you can just, to me, the fear falls away when I know number one, the first draft won't be good. 
fine. Now let's write it. Some people won't like it. Some people don't want to read Stats and Jeff. They're they're lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you know? So fine. Yeah. You know, some people just want to read. Like I talk to uh, corporate business coaching clients all the time. If they do read, they're reading nonfiction. Come on. You're missing out, but okay. Yeah. So I, I think I was just um, interviewing somebody yesterday and we were talking about this very thing. There is no such thing as a perfect book. It's just, there is just never going to be a book that's perfect. And I don't care who you are and what you've written. There is always somebody out there who's going to write just a little bit better than you anyway. And so to, to be paralyzed and I, because I meet so many people who say to me, well, I, I want to write or I've written something, but I don't know. It's just not good enough. It's just not good enough. And, and I try to encourage them, get it out there anyway. And my first book was garbage. I'm real honest about that. It was just garbage. It really was. I'm, I'm embarrassed by it. I still keep it out there because it's a testament to the fact that as a writer, I've gotten better. And I think it's sort of like the first pancake, you know, get it out there. Very few people hit a home run on that first book. It can happen. I'm not saying it doesn't happen because it does. Yeah. Some people are a one and done kind of, you know, kind of person, but I'm not, I, I keep on writing, <laughs> hoping to get better and better as I go. But sure. yeah, the whole, the whole thing is that you have to just get it out there. You have to do it. What yeah, kept you I, motivated I to, to write when you started writing, what was your motivation to finish your projects? Um, Maybe that's just the way I'm wired. I think I'm a little bit more wired on, actually on the opposite end of like being a little too sloppy and which is doubly important for me to get an editor because I like to do something until it's about 95% and then go, eh, I'm kind of bored with this. I'm ready to move yeah. on. Let's just put it out there and see if people buy it and like it. And I think there is kind of a 98, 99% you know, was it Robert Frost who said a poet, a poem is never completed, only abandoned. So mm, I um, like that. There, there is, I, I tend to be not a perfectionist and err a little bit on the side of abandoning it too early. So I really d double down on how much I need editors to tell me this isn't sharp enough yet. And then the discipline to listen to them, you know, yeah. having and to, to go back. And, so I relate to that because, um, I do get bored and I want to move on to my next project that's rattling around in my head. And so I rush yeah. through things. I'm not a detail oriented person We're <laughs> we're in the middle of this self DIY remodel yeah. project for our kitchen, you know, and it's like, Oh, I'm trying so hard not to cut corners and rush through it because I want the end result to be good. But at the same time, like, I'm done. I'm done. Yeah. I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> you know? And, well, and so I really relate to that. Yeah, and Laura, I have a book that I started writing before the the um, steampunk series, and I actually wrote the first about eighty five percent of the first steampunk book, the the Satchel Pong Chronicles, uh, Satchel Pong and the Great Migration, as backstory for this other book, which I oh, must boy. have started writing sometime in twenty sixteen or so, and my wife is just now finishing up the editing on the third draft. So for that book, wow. that I wrote all these other books as backstory for. Now that book is kind of my Huckleberry Finn. And what I mean by that is like Mark Twain had some books that he just he got them done, got them out there because he needed to generate revenue. And that was his whole livelihood was writing. Right. So he had, you know, like um, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court and some of those other ones. He just like, uh, I need an ending chapter. There we go. Let's print it, you know, but Huckleberry Finn took him 10 years to write um, after he wrote Tom Sawyer. I yeah, that was his passion project. Right. And so this other one is my passion project where I'm like, okay, I really wanted to have it done this year. Like my brother asked me last year on my birthday, what's your plan for, you know, my birthday's in, in uh, two days. So oh. he's like, <laughs> well, happy early do? birthday. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So he's like, what are you going to do in the next year? And I'm like, I'm going to get that Zeppelin Zeke book done. And, and it is in the sense that the third draft is done. So I actually have a beginning, middle and ending that's, but it's still being edited. 
so what if it takes two more years? Because that's my Huckleberry Finn. That's like my, that one's got to be not perfect, but as darn close as I can make it. So that's like my legacy. Pro- that's like my, you know, my legacy project. The one that I want actually to, you know, Penguin or Random House to publish. You know yeah, what I mean? I, I, I love so, that. I really love that. You know, um, I write because it's fun. I love the the end result. But I have a, a book that I'm writing right now that I specifically started for my grandson. And it's coming together. I honestly think it's my best writing so far. And I'm stuck, not not because I'm, I don't know. I, I want it. This is my legacy because it is for my grandchildren. I want to make right. sure that this story is is perfect, you know, that it right. comes out of well, here and onto here yeah. exactly the way I envision it. And so I really am taking my time with this and 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 also oops, also enjoying the process as I do that. But I have other books that I well, I I wrote this book, which is my biggest book that I've written, Better Coworkers by Monday. Wrote that in six weeks. I sat down. And I don't think I ate or slept and I had some research to do for that and old notes that I had to go through and everything, but, you know, um, and then I, yeah. I sent it to somebody to have them look it over for grammatical errors and things like that. But, um, but yeah, so it really just sort of depends, I think, on what it is that I'm writing. Right. And even cranking out fun stuff like the Stetson Jeff adventures, you know, Laura is like, it makes me a better writer because mm-hmm. I'm just, yeah. reps, you know. Yeah. And it makes me a better publisher and, and I'm learning to market. Marketing's tough, but I'm learning, you know, through the process of writing all these books that are really just pure fun. And if, if they, you know, if they're successful, you know, commercially great. Um, in fact, sometimes I've thought I'm writing all this really serious stuff. <laughs> you know, this one's, let's, let's break it up a little this bit. One's probably the one that's <laughs> actually going to go big. lighthearted. Yeah. Well, hey, on that I note, yeah. I want to show people your website real quick. Let's yeah, see if we can good. go over here. And uh, yeah, here we go. So this is you. This is about Adam G. Fleming. And yeah. we're going to kind of look at this website here. You've got quite a bit going on, don't you? You've got quite a bit. Well, yeah, there's, uh, I think, yeah. I don't know if you're on the About Me page. I am. I am. And this yeah, is a, a free WordPress website, so you get the ads, you know, about yeah, of course, stuff in your ear or whatever. But whatever. I'm gonna, if it's okay with you, we're gonna jump yeah. over to your bookstore real quick, Great. and let's let's take a look. I'm just gonna scroll through here. And so, those of you that are watching, you can go to adamgfleming.com, and you can certainly check out all of these books. There's a purchase button, so you can go ahead and get them. <laughs> Excuse me. This is the Stetson Jeff Stetson or. The Stetson Jeff Adventures, sorry, volume number one, right yep. here. And yep. you had a co-author on this, Justin Fike, correct? Yeah, Justin Fike. That, he's the now, he's, now he's the one that was with you in Bangkok, right? Okay. Right. All right, yep. fun. And there's some other books here. Old Roads, New Friends. Yeah. What is that one about? That one is about my hike, um, my first hike on the Camino de Santiago, which is a pilgrimage route in Europe. Uh, actually, it's a network of routes. You can hike all the way to Santiago from France, from Lisbon and Portugal, from all over Spain. And so I took a route from Porto, Portugal, about 160 miles and walked oh, how um, fun. in about 12 days to Santiago. And wow. uh, hiking on ancient Roman roads that were put down uh, mm-hmm. 2000 years ago. And, and the stones are still there with wagon wheel ruts in them, eight inches deep, oh, uh, pretty incredible. And then as I'm doing that, I'm also meeting, you know, new friends um, along the way and other people who are hiking the route. So that's so cool. Yeah. Had some, well, you had some pretty cool life experiences. Yep. So travel well, poems. These are poems about traveling, I imagine. Yep, I took that I took that picture on the cover myself of a guy fishing with a net off the on the coast of Thailand. So this is part of the uh Satchel Pong Chronicles that you were talking about earlier, right here. Yep, that's that's okay. the first book, right? So there. yeah, just and I love the cover of this. It's so cool. Who did your covers? Do you design your own covers or do you have somebody sister, else do it? My sister Bethany did the covers for Satchel Pong. Really? Wow. That's 
She's, nice. She did a really nice job. Nice. I'm actually very, very pleased with um, three of them out of the five, especially, but I won't say which. They're all good, you know, but three oh, of them I really like. Amazing. So. Yeah. Beat Down in Bangkok. So this was the one that I think intrigued me the most. And this is the one that you talked about when you were in Bangkok and that cultural, right. you know, cultural shock there. But yeah. it just looks hilarious. And I'm I'm anxious to dive into that one. So that looks fun. Mayhem. What is so this? These are, all, <laughs> these are all that we're looking at here are all incorporated in the um, volume one and volume two sets. Oh, nice, 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 nice. Okay. This is your website, adamgfleming.com. I'm going to scroll up real fast here. So I hope you guys don't get dizzy, but we're going to go real fast here. I want to get back up to the top and, um, you know, just kind of let people know where they can go. That's the bookstore. So if they get on your website, they can just go ahead and click the links and purchase whichever book they're interested in, or hopefully, hopefully get the whole series because, you know, what fun is it to read just one and not know what happens, right? You know, for people in the USA, I love to ship books out by hand and sign them for you. So nice. Um, I can just give my email address. People can get to me. It's agf at adamgfleming.com. Agf and, at adamgfleming.com. So is there a link on your website to your email address? I'm not sure if there is or not. So okay. Okay. But they can remember. they can get a hold of you. And I think I think or you also have. Facebook. You yeah, let's let's go over there. Let's take a look at that Facebook page real quick too. Yeah. Um, so this is your author's page that we are looking at on Facebook. This is Adam G. Fleming author, and they can just connect with you there if they wanted to, correct? Right. Yeah. Let's uh yep. follow me there. Whoops. I think we got off there somehow. Okay. And could they send you a message through here if they want to also? Of course. Okay. Yeah. All right. All yeah. right. Cool. So if people want autographed copies, um, almost all my books are available in paperback and I can send them out. Okay. Nice. So those are two ways that you can connect with Adam. You can either go to his website, um, adamgfleming.com, or you can go over to his Facebook authors page and check him out there. That's cool. So what would you say to now correct me if I'm wrong, but you actually help writers you you sort of coach people in writing as well don't you i do yeah we actually have a business called victory vision publishing um yeah. it's at victoryvision.org victoryvision.org yep so we have full service um self-publishing consulting company which means that we are not a publisher traditionally but we do ghost writing for um you know like for other coaches who want to have a book out to share their expertise we do um, the editing and proofreading as my wife is involved in leading that team and then production and and even some marketing services to help people get the their book in people's hands. And that, we're primarily working with coaches, consultants um, and experts and people like that, but uh, also do some coaching. So some people like I actually had a meeting earlier today. The guy was like, I think I need some ghostwriting. Oh. And I said, you know what? Uh, Ghostwriting's like a little expensive. So let's yeah. talk about maybe I can coach you for a fraction of the cost to help you get unstuck to finish your own book. Not so I want to I want to share you. that website with our audience because yeah. honestly, Adam, this is you know this is what we're here for. This is what this channel is all about. It is about helping and encouraging new writers. And so there yeah. may be somebody out there that even though they've gone through all the YouTube videos that they can, or they've read, you know, whatever they can to teach them about writing, maybe they've taken some English classes or some writing classes, but they yeah. just need that extra help. This is where you come in and you can actually help people. And so I want to share this. Um, this was the founder. I believe you told me that you sort of yeah. inherited this business from, from Julie Ballard. Yeah. Am I correct? Right. We inherited it at the beginning of 2023 from her. And I mean, she's not deceased. She passed it on to us. She's still with right. us. Yeah. That, that's good that we made that clarification. <laughs> Clarify. There. Julie is Julie's with us. And, uh, okay. and um, yeah, so 
Yeah, so I'm the CEO and owner, and my wife is my primary partner. And then Jamie is um, on deck to help us with um, project management. Okay. So we have we have a nice little team going on, and uh, I, I there's a books tab there as well. There is. I saw that. Let's go up there and take a so, look at some of these books that are here. Obviously, we you know we don't guarantee, and you'll see some of my my copies on there too, but. We don't guarantee that that people will sell, but when they work with us, even if it's as a coach or even if they just have us do their editing or proofreading, um, we mm -hmm. put their books on our website because I feel like the best way that we can um, promote ourselves as a company is to help promote our authors and show off. Of course, absolutely. They've done so. Um, now, do you help um, people with like cover creation? Um, yeah, what specifically cool. can you help people with? So if somebody needed a ghostwriter, you could help with that. Correct. And if they needed editing, you could help with that. But what about, um, you know, maybe somebody has a yeah. book that they've had out for a while and it's just, they're just not getting much traction. Do you help them with that as well? Um, I would say perhaps it would depend on the it would depend on the book itself i would say ideally that would be somebody you know in the con coaching consulting expert uh or speaker role who wants some help uh getting attention on linkedin and things like that so that uh they can get more gigs using okay. the book more as a lead magnet than as like i want to sell more copies of it okay um, so yeah. yeah so That'd and that would good. that would fall mostly in the nonfiction genre i would imagine correct yeah okay and then there's a there's blog uh so you can go you know check that out there's also a tab for servicing what you know what services you offer and the prices and things like that and and people could always get a hold of you if they want more answers yeah. to that but but here's what i'm going to say to our audience and i don't want to get off this page quite yet let me go back to this about page here yeah um kind of let people know what victory vis vision is publishing is all about. So this is what I want to say to our audience. I know um, from experience that it's really easy to think that I've got this, I can do this all on my own, but I'm going to tell you from my experience, you need other people in your life. If you really want to sell your books, if you want to get better at your writing skills, if you want to, um, learn how to promote yourself in a more professional manner. I don't care who you are. It's always good to have somebody get that second set of eyeballs on your book, get a good editor, get uh, somebody who knows a little bit about marketing, find somebody who's going to look over your cover and say, yeah, that looks good or that doesn't look good. And so a company like this, victoryvision.org, where they're going to coach you and they're going to give you some good, solid advice on what direction to go with your book, or maybe you just, you know, whatever help you might need. Um, and maybe, maybe your project isn't something that Adam and his team could help you with, but maybe it is. And I would highly recommend. And the reason I'm saying that I would highly recommend a company like this is because here's what's going to happen. Let me get off the screen for just a second so we can have a conversation about it. As soon as you write your book, and correct me if I'm wrong, Adam, and you put that book out there on Facebook, um, Instagram, I don't care where you put your book scammers are going to come out of the woodwork <laughs> and they are going to send you messages and they're going to say to you, I will promote your book. And they're going to charge you stupid amounts of money for absolutely nothing. And they are not yeah. reputable. They are not trustworthy. And half of them don't even speak the language that you've written your book in. So my suggestion is you have here a, a issues, very, right? yeah, yeah. You have right here a very good, reputable resource if you go over to victoryvision.org and make sure that you know that these people are legit and they really are going to help you. Never, ever, ever um, agree to sign up with somebody that <laughs> messages you in one of those scammy posts. Boy, that's that's the greatest fear. And I know some people who have, because they get so excited, they've got their book published, they don't know what to do with it, or they don't know how to get their book published. And, and these scammers come along and they, you know, they, they catch people when they're at their most vulnerable. And so I know you guys aren't going to do that. If you can't help somebody, you're going to say, I'm sorry, we can't help you. But, right. um, but yeah, I, I cannot stress and, and going someplace can, reputable if, enough. If we can, it might not be cheap, Laura. 
but you but get what you pay for. You get, you do get what you pay for. And so mm -hmm. if, if somebody says they're going to do something for you for $50, there's a good mm -hmm. chance it's going to co cost you $50. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and then you're going to have to pay again to get it done right. And you, you're right. You'll end up paying twice as much in the long run. So, and yeah. you know, what's your difference of cheap, not cheap, you know what I'm saying? It's like, like we all have a threshold. Everybody has a financial threshold yes. and it's, you know, maybe some people won't be able to afford you. Maybe you will have priced them out. But my point to all of this is to just not fall prey to these scams that are out there yeah. and to, to find reputable places to get help. I had, I had one the other day and they were like, Oh, we'll, we'll help you get your book published and stuff. So I'm like, okay, let's see where this goes. So I, you know, I like to toy <laughs> with them a little bit. Oh, and of I course. Said, well, are you an agent? So what does that mean? That means someone who you send a query letter to mm -hmm. and they decide if they want to represent you to the publishing companies correct? Um, for a, a contract where the agent gets a cut. Mm -hmm. And I went back and forth and they were like, oh yes, yes, we're an agent. We'll write the query letter for you. And I'm like, wait a minute. That's not how it is. Finally, they dropped a link in and it said self-publishing consulting company. And I was like, you just told me. You like, were an is, agent. Yeah. You just told me you're an agent. And then when you dropped me the link to the actual company, it's a company like the one I run, mm -hmm. but you're misrepresenting what you do. Exactly. I think the person running the Facebook thing was, you know, somebody from another country who doesn't even understand the language of publishing what's right. an agent let's talk you know, about that for a minute because i think even new writers don't know the difference they don't right. so let's talk about that for a minute so yeah an agent is somebody who's going to represent you to those publishing companies and then the publishing the company ones, is a, is a company that will actually publish your book right and do the promoting for you and all of that stuff and sometimes for a fee and i tell people mm -mm, don't ever pay a, a fee for a publishing company to do that because we live in a day and age where you don't need permission to get your book published. You can self-publish on your own. So, um, but the, the better thing of all of these would be a consulting company, a company that's going to help you through the process. Right. Right. That that's my opinion. I mean, yeah. everybody has their take on it, but that's just my opinion. Well, to me, the difference is a publishing company is not, not going to charge you a traditional publisher if won't charge you if they're legitimate. If they're legitimate, yeah. they won't charge you, but they will take a lot of your royalties. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's Huge how cuts. they get paid. Right. So everybody's got to get paid, Laura. It doesn't, everybody, it another, right. Yeah. So what we do is different in the sense that we help you self publish. It's an upfront front fee, but we don't touch your royalties. So if you're wildly successful and you paid us X amount, right? You've already you made your money we've made our money and we couldn't be happier for you. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. and, and because you're probably, you're probably going to come back and ask us for help again. You're probably going to refer people to us. But of so course. the thing you're saying to watch out for is somebody who says we will publish your thing. We're going to take a, a fee. for a fee. And we also take royalties. And they, so and there, there are some bad places out there that do that kind of thing. Yeah. I yeah, know too many people get caught yeah. up in that. You did. So, so no, I didn't get caught up in it, but I know oh. some people who have. So yeah. So yeah. I'm going to stress this again, victoryvision.org. I really, really want to stress that for you. I want to make sure we put that out there because I believe that our viewers um, could really use a service like that. Yeah. So we'll make sure that that's out there. Okay. Well, Thank we're, you. we're starting to run out of time here, but I want to give you an opportunity to make sure that you've gotten a plug-in for your latest book. You want to show us that again? Uh, the latest book um, is Stetson and Jeff Adventures, Volume One and Volume Two. So it's a volume two book one set. And, two. Yes. and uh, of course, you could just try Volume One. And uh, if you're one of those people who don't like it, like we were talking about earlier, that's not every book is for everyone. Then you don't have to buy Volume Two. That's but so exciting! I can't you'll imagine nobody really would like cool it though. <laughs> You'll miss a cool ending. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So yeah, you want to make sure that you get that. Any parting words for our viewers today? Anything you want to let them know about writing, about yourself? I just want to say to anybody who is um, considering writing their first book or halfway through and feeling stuck, just don't compare yourself to anybody else. 
don't worry about if it's going to be good or not. Because like we said earlier, it won't be <laughs> at first. And then, so the writing part and the editing part to make it good are two completely different parts of your mm -hmm. brain. They so are. Just, just have fun. Just have fun. And don't, I, I've got a guy we're working with who wrote 2 million words, Laura. And then he called me up and said, my family says it's boring, but I sure had fun writing it. And I said, sir, you did the right thing. Yep. <laughs> Now let's figure out what part of these two million words can make book one. <laughs> oh my. Oh, oh. Uh, that's a lot of words. <laughs> I respect that. I mean, he wrote for seven years without ever asking anybody, you know, other than his family to look at it. And he did it for himself and he did it for fun and had a blast. Yeah. So, okay. And now oh my, I want to you know? touch that very briefly because we are running out of time. There will be things that, that people write because they need to. It, yeah. it, it's just for themselves. I wrote a book that was a, sort of a healing process for me. Yeah. I went through, I'll share it real quick. I went through COVID and got very, very sick and had a little bit of, uh, uh, had a little bit of post-traumatic stress as a result of that. And so I wrote this book, A Journey mm -hmm. Through PCSD, Post-COVID Stress Disorder. And that was really for myself. You know, I never marketed it. I didn't really, um, I didn't do much with it. I've sold hardly any. I sold I, I actually gave the book away to somebody who later came back and said, boy, that really helped me. I needed that. That was just, that was such a good feeling for me. And then I have other books that I've written specifically because I wanted to make money. That's, you know, that was the goal was to use the book to make money. We all have to, you said it yourself. We all need money. That's what kind of makes the world go around. Right. So, um, so yeah, so there's nothing wrong if you have a book out there that you're writing for you or that legacy piece. My friend wrote a book that was a collection of her grandmother's writings, her mother's writings, and her writings, and it's just a legacy book. And sometimes we have things that we want to write so that we have something to leave behind for the next generation, right? So there's different reasons why people write and just get it out there. Just get it out there. Right. And we try to, at Victory Vision, we really try to match up purpose and context. So if your purpose for writing a book was a certain thing, then we're going to help you, like, for example, a legacy book where it's like, we only need 50 copies. If you have money to spend and you want to make it super nice, we can do that. If you just want to get it out there, we can walk you through that process. And so we try to match up what you're going to spend with what you're what you're trying to do with it mm -hmm. so that it's not like, well, that was outrageously expensive for no good reason. For nothing. You know? yeah. 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 That's cool. I love it. I love it. Adam, you have been a fantastic guest. I sure have had fun talking to you and you have so much to offer. You have stuff to offer in this world period, whether it's to new authors or, um, you know, people who want to learn how to adjust to a culture that they're in shock over. So whatever yeah. that is, you have plenty to, to bring to the table. And I'm thrilled that I've had the opportunity to get to meet you. And I wish you all of the success in the world. And I really hope that this next book of yours takes off like crazy. We're going to leave the links to Adam's book. Uh, books and his websites and all of that we're going to leave that in the link um those links in the description of this video yep down there down there somewhere <laughs> and uh so you can go click on that no go, if, wherever they are <laughs> you can go you can go check those out and uh make sure that you get a hold of adam if you have you know any questions right yep thank you so much laura thanks for having me it's been a blast. Thank you for being here. And so I thank everybody for watching today. As always, have a wonderful day and God bless you.